chapter 42 of your Iggy book, Care of the Patients with Eye and Vision Problems. This begins on page 929. Most patients feel like, most people feel like, um, vision is their most important sense. Um, for obvious reasons, this is how we see the world, how we communicate um, with the world. So vision is very important and problems can stem from either a problem with the eye itself or also systemic problems. And the priority concept for this chapter is sensory perception. So your anatomy and physiology review begins on page 930. Remember that the eyeball is round and it sits in an orbit, a bony orbit um, that holds its shape and also protects it. It's a bony socket. Um, there are also muscles and nerves, um, let's see, blood vessels, and also tear-producing glands that are attached to your eye. Now, I want you to note that the um, cornea is in the very front, the external bump there on the front of the eye. The lens is behind that. You have the aqueous humor. You see on the bottom it says anterior segment and posterior segment in this um, picture. The anterior segment is filled with a fluid called the aqueous humor. This is a refracting media that refracts light waves to focus the image on the retina as it comes into the eye. The other thing the aqueous humor does is helps keep the shape of the eye. The behind that you see the vitreous body. The vitreous body contains a gel like substance that transmits light, and this also maintains the shape of the eye. If the eye is not um, in a per has have a perfect pressure, it needs a perfect pressure in order to stay in its round shape, in order to um, be able to focus correctly, and so that you can see the images sharply. So just remember that the vitreous body holds a vitreous gel vit or vitreous humor, and you have the aqueous humor also that um, are fluids that must be um, at a certain pressure to hold the shape of the eyeball. Okay, this is figure 42.2 on page 931 and 42.4 on page 932. Um, this just shows the flow of the aqueous humor in, and the vitreous humor um, going back and forth, okay? And remember I said that it's got to be at a certain pressure so that everything works correctly. Then externally you have the muscles that are shown there, um, different muscles that hold the eye where it needs to be held. If somebody, sometimes people are born with weak musculature and uh, they have to go in and surgically um, increase, let's see, how do I explain it? They, they, I guess, um, pull the muscle so that it's tighter, um, so that it has more strength to hold the eye correctly. People who are cross-eyed or have a lazy eye, this is the problem. And, um, if left un, unchained or uncorrected, um, it can be okay as far as like a lazy eye. Some people just deal with that, but um, with cross eyes or a lazy eye that's really cross crosses in really bad, um, it can end up causing double vision. So it's really important that that is taken care of at a young age. So looking at refraction, we have emetropia, excuse me, which is perfect refraction of the eye. Hyperopia is farsightedness. There's not enough light refracted in the eye. Myopia is nearsightedness, where the eyes overbend the light. And then some people have what's called an astigmatism. There are uneven surfaces in the eye that distort vision, okay? Pupillary constriction is called meiosis, and dilation is called mydriasis. This the reason that your pupil constricts and um, expands is to control the light entering the eye. 
accommodation means the uh, there is a focus and adjust as an object comes closer to the eye and convergence is when both eyes turn toward the nose when you put an object close to the nose okay um, so all of these provide a clear image and that's on page 932 your pupillary constriction, again, meiosis is constriction, and mydriasis is dilation. Um, and this just shows you how the pupil looks. This is on page 933. Eye changes associated with aging. On page 933, you have a big box that says changes in the eye and vision related to aging. Okay. Um, structurally, there is decreased muscle tone. There's drier eyes because of decreased tear production um, also the lower lid kind of falls away from the eye the upper lid tends to um, droop more and the eyes appear more sunken the ocular muscles aren't as strong the lens loses elasticity um, the lens can harden and form a cataract this will go over cataracts a little bit as well also the iris and pupil are affected in that the pupil doesn't dilate like it should. So um, that's what makes it more difficult to see in the dark for people that are older. Um, sometimes people have to place things farther away from the eye to get a clearer focus because of those changes in the pupil constriction. Um, so your vision field is narrowed or their vision field is narrowed. Another thing that happens is their color perception decreases, which is kind of interesting. And intraocular pressure will increase. Okay, that's why uh, people can get glaucoma as they get older. Okay, this image shows Arcus senilis, which is the, um, the deposit of fats that causes this circular ring around the eye, around the iris. And it's usually kind of a blue, um, blue gray or white or a little bit of both. Um, this does not affect vision. And you can see this on page 934, figure 42.7. Health promotion and maintenance. Look at the best practice box on page 934. You will see the basic eye exam frequency needed. You need to be familiar with that box there. Um, and as far as health promotion, we want to make sure that people do have regular eye exams, okay? We want them to wear UV light filtering sunglasses. We want them to wear eye and head protection when they're working with any fluid that might splash in the eye um, or anything that might fly into their eye like woodworking um, or sparks or anything like that. Also, we want people to not rub their eyes. We should avoid rubbing, rubbing our eyes um, because any injury to the eye increases our chances of getting glaucoma and cataracts, okay? We also want to make sure that we tell people to you know, keep their hands clean, don't touch your eyes unless absolutely necessary. <laughs> Teach them to use eye drops when needed. Um, and also, people who are diabetics need to be controlling their glucose levels. Remember, we've talked about that. Um, controlling those micro and macro um, conditions that can happen due to the diabetes effect on the blood vessels, okay? Um, and also managing blood pressure for the same reason. We want to protect those blood vessels and protect the oxygenation going to the eye and those little blood vessels in the eye. Okay, when taking a history of a patient with an eye problem, you want to look at gender particularly because retinal detachment is more significant for men and dry eye syndrome more for women. You want to know what occupation they're doing, um, what their job is because you want to know if they're sitting at a computer all day. Um, what kind of strain might be on the eyes. Also, if they're outside a lot with their leisure activities or if they're playing video games or on a computer a lot and that may um, cause eye strain. 
As far as drugs and systemic health problems, if you look at table 42.2 on page 935, you have a nice um, breakdown of the systemic conditions and common drugs affecting the eye and vision. So we've talked about how systemically things can affect the eyes, talked a little bit about that. Um, as far as drugs, the thing is, is some of them cause photophobia, where there's a sensitivity to light. Um, some of them can change the intraocular pressure or cause dryness or cause people to feel like they have something in their eye. Um, so there are several things that you need to know about um, so that you can educate the patient that, you know, this may occur when you take this medication. Your eye may feel like this or that. Um, <clears throat> Then looking at nutrition, what we want to teach them is that a diet rich in red, orange, and dark green vegetables or fruits and or fruits um, is really good for, for eye nutrition. Okay, keep the eyes sharp. And what else? Current health problems. Oh, family history and genetic risk. There are some um, eye problems that run in families. And then as far as current health problems, we basically, we need to know when there was an onset of change in the vision, um, if they're coming in for that particular problem, okay? For the physical assessment, we want to know if they are having to squint to try to see things, look at the symmetry of their eyes and their pupils, um, check brows and lashes because, believe it or not, you can get lice or, you know, sometimes bugs <laughs> um, or debris of any kind, you know, people aren't taking care of themselves and don't have good hygiene. Um, so you need to check the brows and the lashes. The eyelids, um, if they droop, that is called ptosis, P-T-O-S-I-S. Um, the eyelids should touch, the top eyelid should touch the bottom when they when they close or when the patient blinks. Check the sclera, the cornea, and the pupillary, or excuse me, pupils. You will need a pin light to do this, of course. The sclera will be pink, uh, whitish pink in a light skinned person. It will be um, more yellowish in a darker skinned person, typically. If you're checking the cornea, you need to shine the pin light from the side. You may see cloudiness or specks if there has been an injury to the cornea. And of course, you know how to check the pupils. We're looking for Perla. There is the Snellen eye chart to check the visual, um, visual accuracy. And also checking extra, or looking for extraocular movements and checking for extraocular movements. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we do the the, the six-point vision test where we're, you know, we hold a, a pencil in front of them and we have them follow the pencil or our finger with their eyes, okay? Um, all of those are important in detecting extraocular movements and things like that. As far as psychosocial assessment, um, you know, people when they're losing their vision or they have vision changes, it's going to increase their dependency. Some people don't um, do well with that. They may have a lot of anxiety due to vision change and they might be really afraid. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're helping somebody who has a vision problem. Laboratory and imaging. Okay, let's look at 936 and 937. You always need to obtain a lab specimen prior to putting any antibiotic ointment in the eye. That may seem um, obvious, but it's something that we need to think about because you might forget and you always want to get your lab specimen ahead of time. They will do conjunctival swabs and scrapings um, to get a culture. They can do a CT scan to find tumors and they do use contrast when they do that. They can use an MRI to evaluate tumors. If somebody has had an eye injury and there is metal or suspected metal in the eye, you would absolutely not 
do an MRI. That would be an absolute contraindication for an MRI. Radioisotope scanning locates tumors and lesions, and ultrasonography is done to diagnose trauma and also to find a retinal detachment. Okay, looking at further assessment, now if you look at figure 42.8 on page 936, that was what I was talking about when you're doing the six cardinal position, um, indicating the functioning of the cranial nerves three, four, and six. All right, so that's what I was talking about with the eye movements and using a pencil or your um, finger, okay? The other thing is the um, color, color testing, color vision testing, figure 42.9 shows that. You should be able to see a five in the middle of that um, circle there, okay? The slit lamp exam, look at figure 42.10 on page 937. Probably all of you have had an eye exam at some point in your life and you've had this done. You just did know it was called a slit lamp ocular examination. So that's what that is. Um, corneal staining, they do a topical dye in the conjunctival sac. The cornea will become visible so they can see any trauma or abnormality to it. Tonometry measures the intraocular pressure. And the ophthalmoscope is used to see the red reflex. Um, it allows them to see internal and external structures. If a patient is confused or if they um, don't speak English as their primary language and they really have a difficult time understanding what you're doing, you do not use the ophthalmoscope on them. So confused or different language, don't use the ophthalmoscope. Obviously, if somebody who speaks a different language has an interpreter right there and can help, that would be fine. All right, let's look on page 938 at figure 4213. This is someone using the ophthalmoscope. Again, I'm sure you've all had this done at some point in your life. And then if you look at table 42.3, this shows you the structures assessed by direct ophthalmoscopy. So it just goes through all of the things that can be detected. And typically the bedside nurse is not usually doing the ophthalmoscope. However, if you ever need to, you'll know what you're looking for. Now, the fluorescein angiography shows the circulation in the eye. You know the eye is rich with blood vessels. Electroretinography is a, shows the retina's response to light. Gonioscopy shows glaucoma. An ocular coherence tomography shows an image of the retina and the optic nerve via ultrasound. So that's what all those interesting tests are. And this is just another picture of the slit lamp um, examination, which measures intraocular pressure. And this is the picture of them using the ophthalmoscope. Okay, now we're going to talk about cataracts. If you look at figure 4214 on the bottom of page 938, the, it would actually be the patient's left eye, the, the left or the eye on the right of the picture shows a, a cataract. You see the opacity there, um, very obvious. It's not something you have to detect with any kind of test, okay? You can see the cataract over the eye pretty easily. This is figure 42.15 on page 939. The cataract causes the cloudiness of the lens. You see that at the front of the eye there. It will cause blurred vision, decreased color perception, and gradual vision loss. There is no pain or eye redness with the cataract. It causes difficulty driving, especially at night. Um, also, reading is affected, and it's interesting to note that you can have cataracts in both eyes, but they progress at a different timeline. So they progress diff differently. So cataracts can even be present at birth, which is kind of interesting. Um, they typically develop later 
in age. Um, usually it's after 60, but I do know some people in their 50s who have had to have cataracts removed. It can be caused just from aging or it can be caused by trauma or exposure. And it also can occur with other diseases and eye disorders. So most cataracts are age related. And by the age of 75, most Americans have had a cataract. So how can we prevent them? Avoid heavy sun and UV light exposure, wear sunglasses, wear eye and head protection, and stop smoking, of course. Now, for the assessment, you want to ask about recent and past eye trauma. Exposure, meaning exposure to x-ray, radioactive materials, and UV light. Certain drugs increase the risk of cataracts, notably beta blockers and corticosteroids. Ask them about systemic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and thyroid problems. Ask them about intraocular diseases as well. Um, and of course, family history and whether or not they smoke. And the health provider is usually going to perform the eye exam, of course. And this is on page 939. Impaired visual sensory perception due to cataracts. This causes a safety risk, a risk for falls, a decrease in their ability to perform ABLs, and a decrease in their independence. So surgery is the only treatment for cataracts. They can be removed. It's pretty easy. For pre-op, we're going to give them eye medications. There will be antibiotics given subjunctively. These will dilate the pupils and cause vasoconstriction, paralysis of the lens, and a local anesthetic will be injected into the eye. Operatively, they will use sound waves to break up the um, op opaque lens, and the pieces are then sucked out of the eye. Postoperatively, they do not have to wear a patch over the eye, okay? They will go home in about an hour. They may have some mild itching for a few days. They will have um, eye drops, lots of eye drops to put in during the day, all throughout the day. If you look at page 941, table 42.5, Activities that increase intraocular pressure. So we want them to not increase intraocular pressure, all right? So we want them to be careful as far as sneezing and coughing, blowing their nose. We don't want them to strain. Um, they need to not be lifting anything heavy, bending over far. Um, it even says to be careful wearing tight shirt collars. So anything that's gonna increase the pressure um, we want them to avoid that. They need to wear dark glasses and be careful of bleeding and infection. They need to call um, the surgeon right away if they have any indication of bleeding or infection. This is just an image showing the cataract removal. Management and transition home care management, we're going to have to be instilling eye drops. Like I said, it's frequent. So if they can't do it themselves, a family member or a friend, um, there are adaptive equipment available. If you look on page 941, there is an auto squeeze that is a self-administering mechanism for eye drops. Um, page four, or excuse me, figure 4217 on page 941. Again, we want to remind them to report complications they will have some activity restrictions as noted in table 42.5. And also they may have to have a home health um, RN come out for a time anyway to help them and assess things. So our evaluation, we obviously want improved vision for these patients after the cataract is removed. There is a patient after cataract surgery box on page 942. You can look over that. Okay, next we have the exemplar on glaucoma. So pathophysiologically, there is an increase in ocular pressure. This is due to inadequate drainage of the aqueous humor or overproduction in the aqueous humor. Um, there are primary, secondary, and associated glaucoma. Primary is our most 
common type of glaucoma. So what happens in glaucoma is the optic nerve is damaged and this can lead to blindness. Often, originally, there is such a gradual loss in vision that people don't even realize, they don't notice that they are actually losing their vision. If you look on page 942, table 42.6 gives you common causes of glaucoma and goes over for primary, secondary, and associated glaucoma for each type, the common causes. With primary open angle, there is inadequate drainage of the aqueous humor. There's more being produced than drained. That means there is an increase in pressure, okay? In acute glaucoma, which can happen, this is an emergency situation, there will be a sudden onset it is considered closed angle glaucoma when this happens. They will have um, eye pain, nausea and vomiting. What's happening is the uh, outflow is blocked. So the outflow of that aqueous humor, okay, is blocked. That's why it can happen suddenly. The pupil is dilated from medications or from sympathetic stim stimulation. Okay, so again, that is an emergency situation. Etiology and genetic risk, African Americans over 40 and any individual over 60, especially Mexican Americans are more likely to get glaucoma. Those with a family history of glaucoma and adults with hypertension, uh, a thin cornea or optic nerve abnormality. Glaucoma is the most common cause of blindness in North America and affects 3 million adults in the United States. So there are no known ways to prevent glaucoma, unfortunately. So the, the best thing people can do is have regular eye exams. With history and the physical assessment, you want to ask them what kind of vision changes they're having. If they're having a sudden vision loss or pain, redness and corneal edema, so edema in the eye, um, that is indicative of closed angle glaucoma. With open angle glaucoma or primary gla glaucoma, they will often be asymptomatic. The first thing they will lose is their peripheral vision, so that's a clue into that. Ask them if they see a colored halo around lights. That is indicative of glaucoma. Now, what is normal intraocular pressure or normal IOP? Normal IOP is 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. So 10 to 20 is normal. Somebody with open angle or primary glaucoma, their um, intraocular pressure will be 22 to 32. In closed angle glaucoma, it will be greater than 30. With the ophthalmoscope evaluation, um, they will do an evaluation of the optic nerve to look for damage. Okay, we talked earlier about these different tests that can be done um, to diagnose glaucoma. Glaucoma causes impaired visual sensory perception and the need for health teaching due to treatment regimen for glaucoma. These are our hypotheses. Managing glaucoma, planning and implementation. So we want to support visual acuity. Um, there is non-surgical management. We use medications that will decrease the intraocular pressure. They don't improve the vision, but they prevent further damage from the glaucoma. Eye drops will um, decrease the production or increase the absorption of aqueous humor. Pupil constricted um, to increase the circulation also. So the medications will constrict the pupils, which increases the circulation, which then makes for better absorption of the aqueous humor. Okay. Also, this will decrease the production. On page 945, you have common examples of drug therapy. There is a whole big list there. Um, 
prostaglandin agonists, adrenergic agonists, beta adrenergic ad blockers, excuse me, cholinergic agonists, carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, and combination drugs. With surgical management, labor, excuse me, laser, trabucloplasty and trabucloplectomy are both outpatient procedures, okay? Both improve the outflow of the aqueous humor, thus decreasing intraocular pressure. Now, transition management, home care, self-management, they may need home health or a caregiver. Um, there are also support groups for glaucoma patients. They will forever be on um, eye drops once they get glaucoma. They will need to wear a medic alert bracelet. They have to avoid anticholinergics. Um, these are drugs used to treat urinary incontinence, overactive bladder, and COPD. So obviously in the elderly population who would also have glaucoma, this could be a problem. Um, so they should not take those because of increase in intraocular pressure. They need to report pain, any vision changes, and especially those halos around lights. Okay, our goal is to have optimal visual acuity as long as possible. So we wanna decrease the complications and decrease the vision loss from glaucoma. Okay, corneal disorders. Problems with the cornea include abrasion, ulceration, which is a deeper injury than just uh, a surface abrasion. And then all these can lead to an infection causing pus on the eyelids, reduced vision, light sensitivity, pain. We always wanna wear gloves when we're putting in eye drops or examining the eye. And of course, we can give the patients anti-infective therapy, usually in the form of eye drops, you know, directly go into the eye. Because there is no separate blood supply to the eyes, um, uh, the corneal disorder is an emergency. An infection can cause vision loss. So we have to be careful of that. Other problems with corneal disorders, dry eye, um, cancer treatments, contact lenses, a foreign body in the eye, all of these can be a problem for the cornea. Germs enter the cornea through an abrasion causing an infection. If you examine the eye, it may look cloudy and patchy. They can do a culture to pinpoint the organism causing the infection. We wanna go ahead and start them on antibiotics to prevent vision loss. Again, this will be in the form of um, eye drops. They will be given every hour for 24 hours. They will have to get up and do it even overnight when they're supposed to be sleeping, okay? They will have two different bottles, one labeled right for the right eye and one labeled left for the left eye. Okay, keratoconus is the degeneration of corneal tissue resulting in an abnormal shape for the cornea. We do a surgical procedure called a corneal transplant keratoplasty. Um, the cornea is given via an organ donor, so it has to be a match with the patient. Um, eye donations are always needed for corneal transplant, so that's one of the organ donations that you will see. Figure 4219 on page 947 shows us the normal um, profile of the cornea and then a cornea with keratoconus where we have the misshapen and the cone shape, obviously. Um, so you can have this problem due to trauma or it can be just an inherited disease. With the transplant, as with any other organ, rejection can occur. They use corticosteroids and immunosuppressants to um, try to prevent rejection of the cornea. The eye bank takes care of donations. If someone has received a corneal transplant, they will need the head of the bed up 30 degrees. They will get antibiotic drops and will have ice packs over their eyes. Um, there is an eye bank association of America. They have detailed contraindications as well as eligibility um, 
restrictions. And this figure shows how they do the corneal transplant. They remove the diseased cornea, um, then they put a button or graft of the donor cornea. Um, they remove it with the exact same apparatus so that the cuts are identical so that the cornea then fits correctly. They then stitch it into place with some suture material that is finer than human hair. So really fine suture material, which would make sense since it's in the eye, right? We talked about the eye bank um, and the care of the eye donors at death. Um, actually, I talked about people who received a donation. So let's talk about care of potential eye donors at death. Still want to head a bed up at 30 degrees, okay? Decrease that intraocular pressure. You will be applying antibiotic eye drops if somebody is going to donate their corneas. Want the eyelids closed and the ice packs on the eyes. Macular degeneration. This is um, the leading cause of blindness in people over 65. This is on page 948. This is a deterioration of the area of central vision or the macula. It is age-related. Um, either the, the eyes are too dry or they can be too wet. They may be overproducing um, tears. The vision will not get better with macular degeneration. We can use laser therapy or other therapies to seal the leaking blood vessels near the macula. If the patient smokes, the macular degeneration is going to progress faster. And treatment focuses on slowing the process of the degeneration. Holes, tears, and retinal detachments often caused by posterior vitreous detachment. So you, you remember how we talked about how important that vitreous humor is and keeping the pressure right in the eye. Um, suddenly there will be um, an onset of bright flashes of light or floating dark spots. There is no pain usually. So if there's a hole in the retina, there will be a break caused by trauma or aging. A tear is a jagged shaped break. A detachment is when the retina actually deta detaches from the epithelium, causing complete uh, blindness. Signs and symptoms again, flashes of light, floaters, blurred vision. People may describe it as it's like a curtain has been drawn over their eye. And again, there it is painless, but there is a loss of central or peripheral vision. You want these patients on bed rest, both eyes covered. You always want to speak before you approach a patient in this kind of situation. Um, any sudden jerking of the head um, is just going to make things worse, um, increase pressure, and cause problems with could cause more problems with a tear. Interventions. We have laser photocoagulation where they actually create a scar. Also cryopexy is where they freeze um, the retina to create a scar. Surgical repair. There is a silicon oil or gas that is placed inside the eye that will hold the retina in place. Also something called buckling, where they actually hold the retina against an underlying um, structure until it heals. This is page 948 and 49 in your book. Retinitis pigmentosa. This is a rare inherited disease that cannot be cured. Symptoms often begin in childhood. The retinal cells uh, nerve cells degenerate and pigmented cells grow. They have night blindness, loss of peripheral vision, which then uh, goes into total vision loss. There is a lacy, heavy pigmentation. Um, interventions are to avoid drugs that affect the retinal cells and wear glasses with UV protection. 
refractive errors, commonly known as, for instance, nearsightedness and farsightedness. Um, with nearsightedness, this is myopia, the refractive ability is too strong and images fall in front of the retina. With hyperopia, the refractive ability is too weak and the images fall behind the retina. With presbyopia, there is a loss of lens elasticity related to aging. The eye can't focus for close work and images fall behind the retina. With an astigmatism, images focus on two different places on the retina. Contacts have to be more concave if somebody has an astigmatism. Used to, you couldn't wear contacts if you had an astigmatism. You were stuck with glasses. Um, but of course, we've come a long way in all of that. So now you can wear contacts with an astigmatism. Interventions include glasses or contacts to treat any and all of these. Um, also, radial keratotomy, which is an incision that is made to flatten the cornea so that you don't have the um, refraction error. Photorefractive keratotomy, they use a laser to reshape the cornea. LASIK surgery, the laser reshapes the cornea and it can treat nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. A corneal ring treats nearsightedness. It's a flexible ring that they put on the edges of the cornea. With trauma, if there's trauma to the eye, we want to, um, it depends on the area of the eye as to what we're gonna do for it, whether the globe is penetrated and the mechanism of the trauma. So was it a penetrating injury? Um, is it just a laceration or is there something lodged in the eye? Now. With the penetrating injury, so if something is, has stuck into the eye, you never want to remove the object that is penetrating the eye. You want to just cover it and get them to the emergency room. So cover it loosely, um, put, you know, even you could take like a styrofoam cup and put it over um, and secure it, tape it onto the person um, so that the object isn't accidentally bumped or anything, but don't take the object out. Um, there is a surgical removal of the entire eyeball. This is known as enucleation. And that is the end. I'm going to let y'all go over the case study by yourself. Thank you.